convosco José Alberto Carvalho. Boa tarde e uau, 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 é a segunda vez no espaço de poucos meses que enchemos a aula magna de reitoria da Universidade de Lisboa para pensar e debater coisas estranhas. Extraordinário. Bem-vindos. Muito obrigado. Estamos uh, a iniciar, portanto, o quinto e último encontro organizado pela Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos, neste que é o seu décimo aniversário e que uh, acabou por coincidir também com o falecimento uh, do seu principal mentor, Alexandre Soares dos Santos. Encerramos este ciclo no mesmo local onde começámos, no início do ano, a falar sobre o papel da mulher. Uma vez mais, a TVI orgulha-se de se juntar uh, a esta que eu uh, chamo humilde e provocativamente, ao mesmo tempo, é verdade, a grande festa das ideias. E a cada organização, a cada encontro, em cada debate, uh, julgo que ficar absolutamente claro essa dimensão festiva, provocante, ao mesmo tempo, mas inteiramente responsável uh, da, das ideias que convocamos para debater em cada um destes encontros. O desafio desta tarde tem tanto de misterioso como de revelador. Vamos encarar os extremos. Os extremos do conhecimento humano neste momento. Se o universo se expande permanentemente, como defendia Einstein e como a ciência acabou por demonstrar de forma inequívoca, também é verdade que o conhecimento humano acompanha essa dilatação do universo. Portanto, aquilo que nós sabemos é apenas aquilo que nós sabemos em cada instante. Nada mais do que isso. Talvez isso ajude a explicar aquela sensação que todos os seres humanos têm, apesar de ser mais facilmente percebida e sentida pelos espíritos inquietos, que é aquela sensação de quanto mais sabemos, mais percebemos quão pouco sabemos. E quão desconhecido é tudo aquilo que nos rodeia. Julgo que isso ficará muito evidente ao longo uh, das sessões desta tarde, desde logo pelos convidados astronómicos que uh, recebemos hoje e que nos honram com a sua partilha de ideias. E temos também uma plateia muito diversificada, como acontece sempre nestes encontros da Fundação, o que é extraordinariamente bom. Peço desculpa aos cientistas, que serão muitos na assistência, mas julgo que temos sempre que estabelecer um máximo denominador comum para percebermos de que é que estamos a falar. E então decidimos, nesse sentido, decidimos iniciar este encontro de hoje, com um pequeno filme que é relativamente desconhecido em Portugal, julgo eu, enfim, na comunidade científica será totalmente conhecido, mas hum, pela minha própria experiência, cada vez que o partilho com alguém, e já o fiz com um, grupos significativos de pessoas, nunca encontrei ninguém que dissesse, ah, conheço, é verdade, ou pelo menos conhecem, conhecem só uma parte, ou conhecem a versão dos Simpsons deste filme. É um filme... Hum, notável a todos os títulos, foi realizado em 1977, faz, por, faz parte do património imaterial da, libraria, da Biblioteca do Congresso dos uh, Estados Unidos e foi desenvolvido por um, pelo gabinete de um, de um casal de arquitetos, Charles e Ray Eames, um, com o apoio da IBM na altura, a propósito de uma inquietação que esse casal de arquitetos, bastante conhecido na arquitetura moderna, com peças icónicas que desenvolveram, eles tinham ficado muito inquietos com um livro que tinham lido de um, de um universitário holandês e tentaram dar uma imagem visual à inquietação que esse livro lhes tinha provocado. E conseguiram-no, de uma forma que é dois títulos notável. Desde logo a técnica, o filme foi realizado em 1977 e, portanto, os efeitos que são aqui conseguidos são extraordinários e, e depois pelo impacto visual que nos provoca. O filme chama-se The Powers of Ten or The Effect to Add Another Zero. As potências de 10 ou o efeito de acrescentar um zero. Como é que acrescentar um zero pode provocar algum efeito? O senso comum diz que o zero é nada. Como é que se acrescentarmos nada a alguma coisa podemos ter efeitos diferentes. 
Peço-vos que acompanhem esta viagem, pedindo paciência e compreensão a quem eventualmente conheça o filme. É, um, é, é um, uma, uma curta-metragem, é um filme muito curto, tem nove minutos. Peço também a atenção para duas coisas. Ponto um, a narração que vamos ouvir é de um cientista. A voz que faz a narração do filme é de um, uh, de um cientista. Uh, Philip Morrison, entretanto falecido, uh, que foi um dos cientistas envolvido no projeto Manhattan, uh, que acabou por ser... Uh, avocado pelo governo uh, um projeto científico que acabou por ser avocado pelo exército, pela força aérea e pelo governo norte-americano na década de 40 e que culminou com os conhecimentos acumulados nesse projeto com o lançamento das bombas atómicas em Hiroshima e Nagasaki. Philip Morrison dá a voz a este, a este documento e chama a atenção para dois momentos da viagem que vamos assistir. Uma é num sentido ascendente e outra é num sentido descendente. E aquilo que a mim, pessoalmente, mais me surpreende é quão semelhante é, a dado momento, a viagem para cima e para baixo. Uh, vamos, então, participar nesta breve viagem. The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago is the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide, the distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway, power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake. 10 to the fifth meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the Sun. Followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. Ten to the fourteenth. As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. 
Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan, 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. This lonely scene, the galaxies like dust, is what most of space looks like. This emptiness is normal. The richness of our own neighborhood is the exception. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of 10 every two seconds. In each two seconds, we'll appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic. Ten to the ninth meters, ten to the eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at one meter, ten to the zero power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus two, one one hundredth of a meter, one centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn, an outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself, a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space. At last, the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks at intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. 
If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or 1 and 40 zeros. Espero que tenham apreciado esta viagem que nos transporta de formas incrivelmente semelhantes em alguns momentos da viagem. Entre o infinitamente pequeno e o infinitamente grande. E é esse confronto de escalas que está também um, presente aqui uh, esta, esta tarde. O que sabemos, também nos mostra este vídeo, em cada momento é aquilo que nós vemos. E quanto mais vemos, mais sabemos mas ao mesmo tempo mais percebemos que algo nos escapa e que aquilo que nos escapa é provavelmente até muito mais vasto do que aquilo que uh, sabemos. Por alguma razão, os visionários e os uh, futuristas, quando falam de cenários do, do futuro, e toda a gente gosta, quase que necessita de tentar antecipar o futuro de alguma forma, seja para as suas próprias vidas, seja para a humanidade, mas quando os visionários fazem isso, eles procuram um, quase invariavelmente imaginar um cenário que se passa fora do planeta Terra. Aliás, vamos assistir a isso também esta tarde. E isso quer dizer alguma coisa. Mas o nosso primeiro orador, no entanto, vem lembrar-nos o contrário. Que é surpreendente e gigantesco o que não sabemos de nós. Este vídeo mostra como o nosso conhecimento para, numa escala diferente, mais curta, quando mergulhamos dentro de nós, do quando procuramos expandir o nosso conhecimento do espaço e do universo. O que nós sabemos de nós, de nós enquanto espécie, de nós enquanto, enquanto seres únicos, de se indivíduos. O nosso ponto de partida neste confronto de escalas a que nos propomos esta tarde é exatamente a escala mais natural de todas, aquilo que nós somos, de onde vimos e para onde vamos enquanto seres. Chamo então ao palco os intervenientes nesta sessão, Adam Rutherford, geneticista, escritor, antigo editor da Nature, apresentador de programas de ciência na BBC, colunista, já escreveu uma breve história uh, de todos nós que pergunta o que faz de nós humanos e interroga sobre o futuro da vida. Ele vai ser acompanhado por uma das mais conhecidas. Olá, Maria Manuel. Olá, como está? Bem-vinda. Hello, Adam. Olá. Welcome. Please take your seat. Maria Manuel Mota. É uma das mais conhecidas cientistas portuguesas, vencedora do Prémio Pessoa, eh, diretora eh, executiva do Instituto de Medicina Molecular da Faculdade de Medicina da Universidade de Lisboa. E no final da apresentação, vai haver, do Adam, vai haver um pequeno espaço de conversa entre os dois, a que nós vamos assistir com muita atenção e empenho. Okay. Muito obrigada. Olá, muito boa tarde a todos. É para mim um enorme prazer estar aqui. Vou mudar de língua. We are going to switch to English. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a really, really great pleasure for me to be here, not only as a scientist, but as a curious human being, uh, to be able to moderate a conversation. Basically, here, what I'm going to be is just a facilitator of a conversation between me and Adam Rutherford. So who is Adam Rutherford? Okay, so he, he was trained as a scientist, so he's really a colleague, he's a scientist. He 
entered the medical school, but then he decided really to, to move into a different degree in evolutionary genetics, and then he really became a geneticist. He was trained as a geneticist. He performed a PhD at University College London, the same university where I did my PhD, so really, you know, besides this um. one, probably, you know, <laughs> second best one, okay? What? <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically, what he studied during his PhD it was the role of a specific gene, so already from a very early age, he became very interested on the role of genes. So he was studying the role of a very specific gene on high development and how this affects health and disease of the high. But then, after the PhD, he decided that he didn't want to be, you know, like a, a, the traditional scientist and, you know, really performing experiments in the lab, and he decided to, for a different career. And so for 10 years, he became... I just wasn't any good at it. <laughs> It wasn't that I decided, it was, I was not just bad at it. To me to <laughs> say that, okay? So <laughs> I was not there at that time, even to judge. So anyway, so but it became a really what for scientists sometimes is people that have a lot of powers, it, power, because he became the editor of Nature, one of the uh, most uh, um, important journal, scientific journal that all uh, researchers want to publish. And yesterday we had dinner together and we're discussing if we really should want to to really publish there or not as a business, etc. But anyway, he was part of the business for 10 years, and he was really deciding the audiovisual content of that journal for 10 years. But then, after that period, he really became what he called himself in his site, a science writer and a broadcaster. And so what he does normally, he writes uh, frequently to several newspapers. The, I think the most common one is The Guardian. And he pr has produced several science documentaries. He's also the scientific advisor for very different movies. And he writes books. And in fact, he's also here to launch this book. And I think you can acquire this, uh, this book outside. It's not the most recent one. I was just checking your you know, Twitter. So you have just launched one that is, has a very interesting name, because it's how to argue with a racist, correct? So it's uh, an interesting one, but it's still not uh, in Portugal. And, but for me, I think one of the activities that he does and is really very interesting, you know, besides all this, that obviously has a lot of impact, the fact that he writes books is why he's invited to be here and talks about the book, etc. So for us, it's really fantastic. It's also that he hosts uh, in the BBC Radio 4 a program that is called Inside Science. And basically there he invites people and they discuss about scientific subject. But I'm going to take one sentence that is stated in the site of the program, and basically it says, Dr. Adam Rutherford and guests illuminate the mysteries and challenge the controversies behind the science that is changing our world. So, Adam, I have no doubt that this audience now is here on a Saturday afternoon. They could be doing something else. You have a full house, and I'm sure the audience is want somehow a little bit of this uh, uh, illumination about whatever is happening in our genes, what are, uh, is happening in our common or individual stories as human beings. So, dear audience, women and men here, uh, we need to be more and more careful with these days, the, the word that we use, homem, as a word, we are women and men, and it, this is just uh, for a uh, you know, Portuguese thing. Um, and for all the audience here and also at home, because I know that we are in streaming and so we should have a lot of people, please all welcome Adam Rutherford. Thank okay? you. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> Hola, bom dias. That is the limit of my Portuguese. Um, I can also say dois uh, lemois. But that doesn't come up very often. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for inviting me to your wonderful country. Um, from the video that you just saw, where some of the other speakers today will be talking about the very extreme ends, the incredibly small uh, to the universally big. Well, Maria and I, we work right in the middle, which is the interesting bit, uh, which is us. And as a geneticist, um, yes, I am talking about Humankind, not mankind. I wish to include 50% of humans in that as well. Something strange happened in genetics in the last 10 years, which is that um, uh, my field, we are interested in DNA, we're interested in inheritance, um, and 
the study of sex, which is basically what genetics is. But all of a sudden, we became historians as well, because due to our increased understanding of DNA and our ability to get DNA out of people who've been dead for thousands or tens of thousands, or in some cases, hundreds of thousands of years, we suddenly had access to a new historical source, a new text that we could question, verify, check, challenge the way we understand history and prehistory. And so the talk I'm going to give right now is, well, yes, a complete history of humankind. But the way we talk about evolution is that we often use family trees. Family trees at different scales, which range from your family tree, your parents, your grandparents, and so on, to the family tree of our species or our order, the mammals, or indeed the entirety of life on Earth. So it's going to be a complete history of humankind in five family trees. And for each one of them, I'm going to show you that they're not trees. Now, genetics as a historical source has one distinction over other ways of understanding the past, which is that we contain that information. Everyone contains information about their family, their family history, our ancestors, and indeed the ancestors of every life form on Earth. So in that sense, we are not limited using DNA as a historical source. We are not limited to just the stories written by the victors, written by the powerful, written by the kings and queens. However, the kings and queens are the people that we know most about from history. So it's going to be a complete history of humankind in five family trees, which are not trees, and three kings. So that's what I've got in the next 37 minutes. Um, and yes, and thank you for plugging the book. Thank you to my publishers um, and the, the foundation for bringing me out here. It was published in Portuguese, I think, yesterday. Um, so thank you very much for, for that. Now, the, my first tree is, of course, the biggest one of all, the tree of life. All of the best stories in biology are rooted in the work of one particular man who is my personal hero, uh, my intellectual hero, and I think the best thinker, let alone scientist, that humankind has ever produced, and that is Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin, in 1859, produced uh, his great work, The Origin of Species, but he had been thinking about this idea of descent with modification, evolution by natural selection. He'd been thinking about this for more than 20 years before 1859, and he was the first person to sketch out the idea of an evolutionary tree. This is his great idea here, evolution by natural selection, where you can see um, one species diverging over geological time into becoming two, and then four, and that is how life has spread over this planet over the last 3.8 billion years. This was drawn in 1837 in one of his notebooks. The most recent Tree of Life was published two years ago, and it looks like this. Note that it is very similar in shape, but slightly more complicated. And so what we can see from this, this diagram, which describes all life on Earth, uh, in diagram form, is that almost all life is bacteria. So by mass, by cell count, almost all life forms are bacteria. The second biggest group is archaea, which look so much like bacteria but are qualitatively different, but they look so much like bacteria that they weren't really described properly until the 1980s. And then there is the third group, this branch here, the eukaryotes, and that is everything which isn't in the first two groups. So that includes us, and plants, and flowers, and blue whales, and um, everything else. Now, this is one representation of the tree of life, and you can see little blue dots. These, do, these dots here, these are species that we have discovered and described without actually having any physical evidence for them other than DNA. So this is part of the revolution that has been happening in the last few years with genetics, that we can now describe species not by growing cells in cultures, but simply by looking at the DNA that we can find in the environment. Now, this is very important uh, in terms of the origin of life, because when we look here 
This somewhere around here is what we might describe as the origin of life 3.8 billion years ago or so. And this is the first time a life form, which we refer to as Luca, the last universal common ancestor, split via natural selection into two and caused one branch to go in one direction and another branch to go in another direction. And here we have the first splitting of branches on the tree of life. Except that isn't really what bacteria do, and it's not what archaea do either. Because at the root of the tree of life, bacteria and archaea are capable of swapping genes between each other. So we can only pass genes down from parents to child, whereas bacteria and archaea can swap genes as they feel like it. And so what you have, instead of a tree, this is a representation of the root of the tree of life, which is not really a tree at all but it's very pretty. This is an earlier representation which I like. It's called the Hillis Plot, and this shows, uh, it shows about 2,000 um, species which are around the edge. This sort of frill on this wheel here are individual species described by science, and there in the middle is the origin of life. Now, around about 2,000 species there. Science has described about 2 million species. We, at a rough estimate, think that is probably 10 times fewer than the species that, already, that are alive today, maybe something like 20 million or so. And we also know that between 96 and 98% of species that have ever existed are already extinct. So beautiful and complex though this is, this is a tiny, tiny proportion of the total amount of life that has ever existed on this planet, a planet which is bursting with life and is defined by being a living planet. Um, and just in case you're wondering where we are, just concentrate on that bit there which says animals. There we go. We are the tiniest, tiniest twig, the tiniest branch on this enormous tree that has existed for 3.8 billion years. So that's my first tree, which isn't really a tree at all, but it is a nice way to represent life on Earth. The second one I want to talk about is uh, our own evolution, the last million years or so of how we got to be here. Now again, this is a representation of the evolutionary tree of humans on the far left. This is a million years ago, and this is us today. In yellow, this is Homo sapiens. This is us, divided into three large geographical land masses, uh, Asians, Europeans, and Africans. We are an African species. Homo sapiens originated in Africa within the last 300,000 years or so. But about 70,000 years ago, a small group of uh, Homo sapiens left Africa, and that became the population uh, from which the rest of the world, including us, was, uh, was drawn. But in fact, there was an earlier migration, or possibly multiple earlier migrations, out of Africa up to 200,000 years ago. And so we see another branch that came out earlier. We call them archaic modern humans, and earlier this year, uh, a, a paper was published which described Homo sapiens found in Greece about 215,000 years ago. But they left no descendants. They may well have been replaced by another species of human that you'll all be familiar with, the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis. Now, nowadays, we describe Neanderthals as being Western and Eastern broadly. We used to think they were just European, but the more we look, the more we find Neanderthals into, uh, into the East. And you may know as well that in about 2009, for the first time, um, a team led by a researcher who I know was speaking here within the last couple of months, Svanti Pabo, managed to extract DNA from the bones of a Neanderthal man who had been dead for 50,000 years. And with that, we had the entire Neanderthal genome. And this is a revolutionary thing. It has completely changed our entire field. It has completely changed our understanding of human evolution uh, overall. So now we have Neanderthals in two different groups. We have Homo sapiens. And you may remember in about 2010, a tooth and a single finger bone from a teenage girl was found in a cave uh, in Siberia. And that is not enough physical remains to identify a new species. But it was enough with these new techniques to extract the full genome out of the finger bone. 
And with that, if you compared it to the Neanderthals and you compared it to our own genomes, Homo sapiens, we could tell that this was another different type of human which existed, coexisted alongside us in the last 100,000 years or so. So that's the tree of life for the last million years for us, except that genetics, ancient genetics, being able to get DNA out of the Denisovan girl and the Neanderthals, as we now can do, showed us something completely different, that this picture is not very accurate. In genetics, which is the study of sex and inheritance, we have a lot of euphemisms. Um, so we talk about gene flow events. A gene flow event is having sex with someone. Um, so what the genome, what, what our ability to get DNA out of these bones showed us was that there were gene flow events between all of these different types of humans pretty much as often as they could get it on. And so what we actually found out is that the Western Neanderthals had gene flow events with the people of Asia and who would become Europeans. And we know that because everyone in this room carries about 2% of their DNA is Neanderthal in origin. We also know that the Western Neanderthals had another go at this uh, with Europeans about 45,000 years ago. And we know that the Eastern Neanderthals did it with the archaic modern humans, and we know that the Denisovans did it with the Eastern Neanderthals, and the Denisovans did it with the Asians as well. Now, many of you will have noticed that there is a blue line at the very top there, this blue line here, which I haven't mentioned yet, which I think is a bit of science which is so close to magic, which is that when we looked at the Denisovan DNA and compared it to the Neanderthal DNA, they didn't quite add up. And the inference is that there was another um, species of human that existed during this period that we don't have any physical remains for, and we refer to this as a phantom human, but we know it because they had gene flow events with the Denisovans. Now, I, I don't, that doesn't look much like a tree to me either, and I'm part of a small group of scientists who feel that we might need to retire the idea of an evolutionary tree. And in writing this book, I was struggling to think of a better word to describe what that picture is and how humans have behaved over the last million years in our own evolution. And I decided that the best way to describe it was a one million year clusterfuck. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. OK, so that is my second tree. That is our story, our prehistory, a million years of us. But now I want to bring it into history itself, because this is absolutely fascinating, how genetics as a historical source relates to modern history, to the stories that we learn in history. And for that, the best example, one of the best examples that I love talking about, has particular resonance for where we are right now, and it is the twisted tree of the Habsburgs of Spain. How do you feel about that? OK. Now, let me introduce you to um, Charles II of Spain, Carlos, who was the last ruling member of the Habsburg dynasty, who died in 1700 uh, at the age of 39. Now, the Habsburgs, as I'm sure, I'm talking to Portuguese people, I'm sure you know, the Habsburgs were an enormously powerful family that ruled the largest part of Europe for more than 200 years. And during that time, provided six, every single, Holy Roman Emperor. They were a family of enormous dynastic power. But Charles had an extremely troubled life. Um, he was profoundly physically disabled and mentally impaired. He didn't learn to walk until he was about seven. He didn't learn to talk until he was eight or nine. The characteristic Habsburg lip or chin, which we call a prognathous jaw in modern medical parlance, was so pronounced in him and his tongue was so swollen in his mouth that he couldn't retain food or water when he ate. And on his throne in Madrid, there was a semicircular curtain in front of his face so that his courtiers couldn't see the food falling out of his mouth. Um, he was sterile, uh, he was impotent, he was uh, married twice to Marie Louise of Orléans and Mariana of Neuburg, and both of them in private diaries described his inability to um, 
have gene flow events with either of them. Um, and he died in 1700, leaving no son or heir. The Spanish uh, courtiers, his people, were not particularly kind with his, um, uh, with his nickname. He was known as Carlos el Hechizado, the Hexed, or the Bewitched. Now, the reason he was bewitched, let's think about that chin and that jaw for a bit. Here are some of his family members who all have that very characteristic jaw, the Habsburg jaw, or the Habsburg lip. And it was considered to be a badge of honor, a badge of divine authority passed down within their family. To have the Habsburg lip was a sign that you were powerful. Now, of course, you all know who this guy is. That's Philip the uh, fourth of Spain, but Philip the third of Portugal. And he, of course, was the last Spanish king of Portugal, deposed in the Portuguese Wars of Restoration in 1640, and replaced by, um, replaced by who, Maria? We spoke about it last uh, yesterday at dinner. Um. Portuguese history is not my strong point, but <laughs> how do we feel about Philip III? Very badly. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. OK. So this is the family that Charles comes from. Now, I want to show you what a standard family tree looks like. This is the type of family tree that we work with, where you are at the bottom, two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. And if you go eight generations back in your family tree, you will have 256 people above you on your family tree. Hold that thought in your head, and let me show you the family tree of Carlos El Hechizado. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, there are 29 people on his family tree. Um, so what this means is, well, it's very bad. This, this accounts for a lot of Charles's problems. This is Charles here, and this is uh, Philip IV of Spain, Philip III of Portugal, his father, and Mariana of Austria, his mother. And then there's Philip III of Spain, Philip II of, of Portugal, Margarita of Austria, his grandparents. But that's one route there. But if you follow via his maternal line, you also get to Philip III and Margarita of Austria, which means that Margarita of Austria is his grandmother and his great-grandmother at the same time. This is what we refer to in biology as suboptimal. You think? Yeah? Very much. Um, in fact, family trees, where we talk about them being branching structures, they should never have loops in them. They only have loops in this family tree. Um, and it all starts with the marriage of Philip of Castile, Philip the Handsome, to Joanna of Castile. So this entire dynasty is drawn from one pairing. Now, Joanna of Castile, I'm sure you know your uh, Iberian history. She had a nickname as well. Uh, there she is, Joanna of Castile. She had a lot of um, mental health issues, which are difficult to diagnose posthumously, but she was known by her courtiers as Joanna la Loca. Possibly not the best start to a dynasty. Um, so when we go back to the family tree, here is one route via Philip III, Philip II, Isabella, Philip. We could take another route via Maximilian II, one of the Holy Roman Emperors, or we can go on the maternal line via those guys, or we can go this way, or we can go this way. There are nine, nine different routes to get from Charles II to Philip and Joanna, which again is what we might describe as suboptimal. What this means from a genetics point of view is this. We inherit half of our genome from our mothers and half of our genome from our fathers. We have a metric, we have a, a, a measure for understanding how much of those two genomes, two half genomes, are the same as each other. The chromosomes you inherit from your mother, the chromosomes you inherit from your father. And this is important because recessive diseases emerge when you have the same disease gene inherited from both mother and father. So ideally, you want them to be as different as possible. The metric that we use to understand inbreeding, the inbreeding coefficient, is a measure of that. And let me just give you an example. If a brother and a sister were to have a child together, then their inbreeding coefficient would be 0.25. 
So a quarter of their genes are identical from both sets of chromosomes. When Charles Carlos El Hequitado's uh, inbreeding coefficient was calculated in 2014, it came out as 0.254, which is higher than that of a brother and sister. Now, I love this story because it shows the absolute integration of both genetics and family trees and world history. Because what happens here is that the, the Habsburgs were trying to hang on to power by this insane inbreeding program. And this mark, the badge of honor, their, their chins, was a, a complete error because they had a 17th century understanding of genetics. And so maintaining power, the more they tried to maintain power within that family, ultimately resulted in Charles being infertile, leaving no heir, the Spanish War of Successions, and the Habsburgs never holding significant power in Europe for the rest of, of history. So it turns out that inbreeding is very good for genetics. It's very good for understanding how inheritance works, but it's really, really bad for families. So that's my second king and my third family tree. Um, an another story, this is from British history, which you may be less familiar with, but it is the, the death and rebirth of Richard III. So again, I want you to think about that standard family tree. One parent, oh, sorry, two parents, four grandparents, etc. 256 people. Now, this is an, an idealized version of how families are meant to work. This is a standard depiction of a family tree. And of course, real families just aren't like this, because people move about, people fall in love, they, people die, they remarry, they have affairs, and so on. And so family trees never, ever look like this. And instead, they often look something like this. Now, I know you can't see the details on this, but this is the family tree of Richard III, who is an enormously significant king in English history, because he was the last king to die on the battlefield. Um, and he was also the last king of a particular branch of British royalty, the Plantagenets, which starts with Edward III up here and ends with Richard III when he is defeated um, at, at a significant battle, the Battle of Bosworth Field. Um, and the person who replaces him is Henry VII, the first Tudor king, and then Henry VIII, and then the dissolution of the monasteries, and so on and so forth. Now, for various reasons, um, Richard's life is not well documented, or, or particularly his death is not well documented. We think we know a lot about Richard's death because Shakespeare wrote Richard III, one of his great um, uh, tragedies. Uh, and Richard is an, a, a villain. He's an absolute, one of, maybe Shakespeare's worst villain. And that may or may not be true, but it is, of course, fiction and, and not history, but there is some historical accuracy in there. There is one account of the Battle of Bosworth Field from a contemporary historian, Jean Molinet, which describes several things of importance, which I, I will mention now and come back to. And, and they are this, that Richard was leading his men with a helmet on, and he was riding on a uh, horse, and he took his helmet off and dismounted his horse in order to address his uh, troops. At this point, he was struck uh, on the back of his head and killed. So maybe taking the helmet off wasn't such a good idea. Um, but he was stripped naked. Uh, his armor was taken off, and he was put over the back of a horse and paraded around the town of Leicester uh, before being thrown in an unmarked grave outside a monastery in the city of Leicester. And that is pretty much all we know about the end of Richard III. So people have been looking for Richard's grave ever since. And in the 20th century, a large group of historians, amateur and professional historians, have been hunting for the grave of Richard III for more than a century, using traditional techniques, using paper and documents and certificates and things like that, uh, but also using uh, new uh, scanning technology from physics. And eventually, they came to the, the conclusion that the likely site of Richard's last resting place was in a car park. Um, and that is Leicester Social Services. And this is the car park. And they thought he might be somewhere along here. Um, so in August 
2014, they started digging. And on the very first day, has anyone been on an archaeological dig in this audience? Right, well, I have, and when you go on an archaeological dig, you spend absolutely months sitting in muddy fields or caves with a trowel and a toothpick and scraping things away, and eventually, if you're really lucky, you find a piece of teacup from the 1980s. Um, it's a deeply unrewarding business. I salute my archaeologist friends. Um, on the first day that they were digging in Leicester car park, they found this. Now, immediately, this, there's a number of things of enormous significance in uncovering this skeleton. Um, and, and I'll just take you through a couple of them. The first thing is that, well, it's a man, right? So we can, we can tell that it's a man due to the shape of the pelvis and due to the shape of the skull. It has no feet, but we don't know why that is. We think they've just disappeared over 500 years or so. Um, one very striking thing is that there's no coffin. So this is someone who is put in a grave without a coffin. There is no burial shroud, so there's no evidence of material. There's no evidence of clothing. This is a naked man who's been put into a grave. So immediately, the historians are thinking, this might be a good candidate for Richard III's body. We also think that the position of his hands is significant. They were tied. It looks like that they've been... Just kick that light. It looks like they've been tied to the side. There isn't any evidence of binding there, but the position of them is interesting. And so again, we think this might be evidence of, Richard, uh, of this being Richard. So the first thing you do is you take the body out of the ground and clean it up. And this is what the skeleton looks like once it had been cleaned up. Can anyone spot anything unusual about this skeleton? Yes? Any doctors in the audience? So this is what's known as uh, scoliosis. Um, what is it in Portuguese, Maria? Scoliosis, OK. And scoliosis is a curvature of the spine. Now, you will remember from uh, Shakespeare's Richard that he describes him as a hunchback, that he had a, a hunch and he was bent over. A twisted usurper is how Shakespeare describes him. Scoliosis doesn't give you a hunchback, but the curvature of the spine does mean that one shoulder can be significantly higher than the other. And when it is this pronounced, we think that this person's uh, left shoulder would have been about six inches taller than his, uh, his right shoulder. So again, this is beginning to look like it might well be the body of Richard III. Uh, when you look at the skull, this is the skull. Uh, it looks okay from the front. It looks like a skull that's been in the ground for 500 years or so, until you turn it over. Now, this hole here is where the spine joins the skull. This is known as the foramen magnum, which in Latin translates as big hole. Um, this hole here is not. That is a wound. Um, we call it uh, perimortem. We can't tell if it is the cause of death, but what we can tell is that there's no evidence of healing around the edge. So it happened around about the time of death. We think from forensic uh, anthropology that it was caused by a flat-bladed axe, uh, a pike is what we call it in British. So it's like a spear with a flat head on the top of it, and an upward stroke up like that, which would have taken off the back of the skull in, and about two cubic centimeters of brain with it. Feel the back of your head and feel how thick this bone is. Now think about the force required to create that injury. The second head injury is this one here, which we think is from a, the spike, the spear of the same instrument, which, if, again, feel the back of your head, is driven through this area, the occipital uh, lobe of the skull, with such force that it not only penetrated the skull, but there is a scrape mark on the inside of the skull on the other side there. So this is a spear that went through the entirety of his head and hit on the underside there. That is also not, uh, it, we call it perimortem again. We can't say that that was the cause of death, but it's probably not great. Um, and remember that the description was that Richard had taken his helmet off, whereas this would have been protected by uh, the, the uh, metal armor at the back of his skull. The third piece of forensic evidence 
is this. This is his hip bone here. So this is your iliac crest here, and this is the hip. And what you can see is that there is a, a graze mark there. Again, this, is, this, is, this happened post-mortem. There is no evidence of wound healing here at all. But the only angle at which this, this could have been made by a, a short sword, we think, is if the body was bent over like this, and we think that the blade went entirely through the gluteus maximus, your ass. Um, and, of course, the armor that he would have been wearing at this time would have covered his flanks, would have gone down past his his um, bottom. Um, and so this is evidence that whoever did this did it to someone who wasn't wearing armor. And remember that the description was that he was thrown over the back of a horse, having been stripped naked, paraded around the town of Leicester, and people jeered, and somebody stabbed him through the ass. So by this point, we've got an enormous amount of physical anthropological evidence which suggests that this body is indeed Richard III. But it was genetics, it was ancient genetics, that came to really seal this story. So, what you do in, in, when looking at family trees is there are two branches, even though most of our genetics is inherited from all parents, there are two branches of our DNA which are only inherited from mother or father. One is called the mitochondrial genome, which is only passed from mothers to both children, uh, sons and daughters, and the Y chromosome, which is only in men and is passed down from fathers to sons. So even though almost all of our ancestry comes from all of our parents, there are these two branches which are matrilineal, and patrilineal, and these are enormously useful in identifying family trees. And so once my colleague Chiri King managed to get DNA out of the bones in the car park, what they then did is try to draw a family tree of Richard as it was known, and use the Y chromosome and use the mitochondrial DNA to try and establish whether he has any uh, descendants. He didn't actually have any children, but descendants who carry the same mitochondria or the same Y chromosome. So we'll do the Y chromosome first. So this is the male lineage via John of Gaunt, and this goes into the Tudors. Um, and then down to, they traced five living descendants, who are known as Somerset 1 to 5 because they didn't want to be named. And the researchers took their Y chromosomes and compared them to the genomes, the Y chromosomes of Richard, of the bones found in the car park. And guess what? They weren't the same. They weren't the same at all. Now, that either means that the bones in the car park was not Richard, which seems unlikely at this point, or there is a break point somewhere in this family tree. And that is what we think happened, what we refer to as a cuckolding event. <laughs> we don't know who or when this happened exactly, but it appears that one of the Queen's ancestors, I mean, my Queen, Elizabeth II's ancestors, was not 100% honest <laughs> about who they had gene flow events with. So the Y chromosome was inconclusive, but we can leave it to the women to sort this out because the mitochondrial DNA provided an absolute answer to that. Two living descendants, a Canadian carpenter called Michael Ibsen and a British woman called Wendy Duldig were identified. And when they looked at their mitochondrial DNA, what they found is that Wendy Duldig's mitochondrial DNA out of 37,000 individual letters of DNA differed by one, and Michael Ibsen's differed by None whatsoever. And so this becomes mathematically conclusive proof that the bones found in that car park in Leicester were indeed the body of Richard III, the last English king to die in battle. So this is a great, great story, possibly the best story of how genetics has become this amazing historical source that can now help us test ideas from history, not just from ancient history or prehistory, but from modern history, and um, the Leicester City Council decided to commemorate this amazing scientific and historical find with this sign. <laughs> okay. Um, Right, I've got five minutes left before we, uh, Maria and I can um, talk, but I want to just bring it all home 
um, with my final family tree. And the reason I want to talk to you about Charlemagne, Carlos Magno, is because I think one of the things I've tried to show today, and one of the things I talk about in all my work, and especially in that book, is that family trees are not really the way that biology works. It's not the way evolution necessarily works. It's not necessarily the way that our own prehistory works, and it certainly isn't the way that families actually behave. So you all know who Carlos Magno is, Charlemagne uh, the Great, the first Homo Holy Roman Emperor, he was known as the great European conciliator, so the first person to unite various factions of European countries. And at this point, I would like to apologize on behalf of the British people uh, for the state of our politics. <laughs> um, and we could really do with a Charlemagne right now to unite us and bring us back into the fold in which we belong. Uh, anyway, so there he is. He's a ninth century ruler, born probably in Belgium, is what is now is, is, is Belgium, and the great European conciliator. Now, when people do family trees, when, when genealogy, which is the second most popular pastime in the UK after gardening, and is the first most popular pastime in the US, um, when people do family trees, they're often looking for people of great significance, royalty, fam uh, yeah, people of great infamy, um, to, I don't know, give them some sense of belonging or some celebrity, some kudos in their own family stories. And we know that people do this with Charlemagne. We know Charlemagne's family tree because he is royalty. And this is just a small section of it. There, there he is at the top. And this only goes down to about the 15th century here. But a Dutch family called the Bacadurks have traced their lineage all the way back to uh, Carlos Magno um, in the 9th century. And in fact, lots of people do do this. Um, just two years ago, Richard Branson uh, announced that he had done his family tree and could trace his lineage back to Charlemagne. And um, uh, Christopher Lee, the great actor, Christopher Lee, was the son of an Italian contest, and so they knew his family tree as well. And indeed, he also was descended from Sauron, uh, from, uh, from um, Charlemagne. Sorry, I get confused. Um, and so this is a great thing to have in your family tree. You can say, I'm descended from the first Holy Roman Emperor, the great European conciliator, Charlemagne, Carlos Magno himself. So again, I want to show you the standard family tree. There it is again. Now look at the numbers on this. So this is one person going back uh, eight generations, which is 256 people. And eight generations in genetics, we use a generation as approximately 25 years. So eight generations takes us into the 19th century, and there are 256 people. Okay, so there's some maths here. I need you to concentrate. So one person has 256 ancestors uh, into the 19th century, which means that four people will have around 1,000 ancestors in the 19th century. And 100 people will have that many, so about 900,000 ancestors in the 19th century. And there are, what, 1,500 people in this audience? So you do the maths and work that out. Um, if you keep going back in time, doubling the number of ancestors that you have, by the time you get to the 10th century, the number of ancestors that one person has comes out as just over a trillion. Now, that is about 10 times more people than have ever existed. We estimate that uh, approximately 107 billion people have ever existed. And yet, one person, going back only 1,000 years, has 10 times more ancestors than have ever existed. So how do we work that out? How could that possibly be true? Well, the answer is kind of obvious, really, which is that you have this number of positions on your family tree. But after a very short period of time, our family trees begin to branch out from us, and then they collapse in on us. And so there are that many positions 
on your family tree, but they're occupied by the same people repeatedly the further back in time you go. And we know this because these are two family trees which, in which uh, these, these two individuals here are first cousins. So they have a shared ancestor in a grandparent, which means that all of the ancestors of that grandparent are shared between these two individuals, which means they don't have 500 ancestors. They have 500 ancestors less the number of shared ancestries. And in genetics, one of the concepts we're interested in is called the most recent common ancestor, which uh, for first cousins is a grandparent. But we're kind of interested in big populations, and so the most recent common ancestor, for example, of the population of Europe is something that has been um, studied over the last few years. And when that is calculated mathematically and now reinforced by, by genetics, what we find out is that the most recent common ancestor for all living Europeans today comes out as 1400. So about 600 years ago, an individual existed that if we could draw a perfect family tree for every living European, which we can't, but if we could, one branch, at least one branch, of every living European's family tree would cross through one individual who was alive only 600 years ago, which I find very touching. I find that shows us quite how closely related we are. This is a conceptual idea rather than an actual individual. But there is a better, we can do better than that in genetics by using maths and genes. And I want to introduce you to a pretty serious concept for a Saturday afternoon, which is called the genetic isopoint. Now, the genetic isopoint is the next mathematical step after the most recent common ancestor. So what it says is that when all your branches of your family tree begin to flow through individuals multiple times, and because there are fewer people alive in the past than there are today, there is a point, a hypothetical point in the past where all branches of all family trees cross through all individuals. And that is known as the isopoints. Now, I realize this is quite a hard concept to get your, ha your head around, but there's multiple ways of describing it. So the first is that the entire population at the isopoint is the ancestor of the entire population today, if they have living descendants today. Or another way to describe it is all branches, as I've said, of all family trees cross through all individuals at the genetic isopoint. And the third way, the way to describe it is if you were alive at the isopoint, then you e are either the ancestor of everyone alive today or no one at all. Yes? Just nod. <laughs> okay, this is what real family trees look like. So this is a model of what family trees actually look like, employing how ancestry actually works, which doesn't branch out eternally to give you a trillion ancestors. It collapses in on itself, and after only a few generations, you can see that every single line of the family tree crosses through every single individual, in which case it just becomes a solid mess. Now, when we calculated the isopoint for the entire population of Europe, the number comes out as the 10th century. So the entire population of Europe in the 10th century, if they have living descendants today, are the entire uh, population, uh, in ancestors of everyone living today. And we estimate that about 80% of people in alive in the 10th century in Europe uh, have living descendants alive today. So that pool, all Europeans are descended from exactly the same ancestors only a thousand years ago. And when we do the isopoint for the entirety of the globe, the world, everyone alive today, the isopoint comes out as the 14th century BC. So everyone living today is descended from everyone living only three and a half thousand years ago, which is an absolutely mind-bending concept but it is also true. So I want to cast your mind back to uh, Carlos Magno, a man who was alive in the ninth century, uh, which is before the genetic isopoint of Europe. And we know that Carlos has living descendants because of Christopher Lee and because of Richard Branson and the Bacca Dirk family. We know that there are living descendants of Charlemagne living today. And because of the genetic isopoint, and because genetics and maths have solved this historical conundrum, it also means 
that everyone is descended directly from Charlemagne. And that includes literally every single one of you in this room. So congratulations, <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so you went a little bit over the time, but I'm sorry. I think I got you know, it was <laughs> worth it for sure. Uh, the idea here is that I'm going to initiate a, a conversation with Adam. We will have time for one or two questions from the public, so prepare yourself. Uh, the microphone is an easy way to get there, so don't worry, uh, wherever you are, okay? And I, I have a policy to take questions from audiences uh, alternating between women and men. And this is not me being politically correct, but there is actual research data which shows that if a woman asks a question first in a public session, then other women will ask questions, whereas if a man asks a question first, then no women ask mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. So it's so a good technique to employ, it really works. So the first question we need to take from a woman in, uh, in the audience, okay? So please be prepared, okay? And we don't want now to, to fail. So <laughs> really, you know, don't get too anxious, but <laughs> get it there. And so let's start the conversation here. It's a little bit strange when you are here. I have never been in this situation because we don't see anyone, correct? So we don't know if they... Uh, is, is, very, is, too is there an audience there? <laughs> exactly. So, but anyway, so... Um, I have two points here. One of the, these concepts that you bring uh, that is very interesting. We are all the same, correct? We come all from the same, you know, father or mother uh, up there, okay? Uh, up, up where? <laughs> <laughs> and, but at the same time, as humans, we have the tendency to like to see ourselves as special. Mm -hmm. So exactly how, you know, it uh, leaves us on this. On the other hand, the other concept that I would like to bring is that about immortality. Because humans, of course, one of the big quests of humans is that, you know, if, can we really be immortal? But in fact, the genetics is telling us we are immortal, correct? Because our genes have been there forever and we are still, they are still here. So right. genes are immortal. So how you... Well, I love thinking about that because the Neanderthals went extinct 40,000 years mm -hmm. ago. We don't really know why. There are plenty of ideas. We may have hunted them to, to extinction. They, we may have brought diseases with us. Maybe we knew that they were never a particularly large population, mm -hmm. and maybe that was not in their best interest, and they went extinct. But did they? Because I can look at you or look at anyone in this room and know that your ancestors were also, and mine, were also Neanderthals, and so we carry their legacy into the future. So they went extinct in a sense, but they are part of our family tree. And the question of immortality, I, I don't know, man. I, who wants to live forever? It just would be boring. Um, I think that... So how many more books could you write? You know? <laughs> <laughs> About one every three years. It would take a long yes. time. Um, I think that... I, I, th I think that... You know, 80 years or 100 years is a good time to spend on Earth, and that our real legacy is not in our own immortality, but it is in the behavior of our children. And that's, that's I don't, I don't want to be remembered, I just want my children to be better than us. Mm -hmm. Before we, now, because now I need to go there to see mm. if I see someone, but I want, yesterday we had dinner together and the Fundação Francisco Manuel Santos gave, provide us as a beautiful dinner with uh, Fadu uh, uh, really there for us. So genes are fate or not? <laughs> not. Okay, so Absolutely it's very simple. Not. Probability. So if there's one thing you take from that book or from my talks or from anything about genetics, it is that genetics is genes are not destiny. Uh, genes are probabilistic. They, it is a probability. We can't even accurately tell how, what color your eyes will be. And we teach that to 16-year-olds. If you're 16, say what it says in the, in the, in the textbook, to, just to get the answer. So uh, now I need hands up there. Oh, so I already have here one. While this is being transported there, go in another one. So how is going to be the future? Because you always talk about the past. So what is going to be the future? <laughs> Can I? Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, the future. Well, I get asked this a lot. Are we still evolving? And the answer is complex. We, we are evolving 
in the sense that we change uh, over generational time. Our children are different from us, and as long as we keep having sex, we will continue to evolve. I if the question is, are we, ev are we evolving under natural selection? I, I don't know. You're going to hear talks from people for whom time scales are either infinitesimally small, from Carlo Rovelli and Michio Kaku, and infinitely big from Zeta and, and Carolyn Porco. Um, our time scales in genetics are, what, 100 years, 1,000 mm -hmm. years, few thousand years at best? So my answer to that question is I, I will definitely have an answer for you in about 5,000 years. Ok, so first question here. Uh, olá, sinto-me um bocadinho tímida para estar a falar em inglês, por isso vou falar em português. I, I can translate, uh, no problem. Eu gostava de perguntar-lhe uh, de que modo é que, uh, enquanto pessoa, enquanto cientista, ou toda a comunidade científica, se sente responsável para fazer o esforço de informar alguns políticos desta irmandade de que todos fazemos parte. Mm -hmm. So basically, they ask what is your role to really provide this information to politicians that in fact we are all brothers and sisters of uh, everyone. So, you know, that many of the political problems that arise from, uh, you know, what is your role there and what is your obligation? Um, the same. You know, the human genome is the largest data set we have ever come across. Every single individual has something like three billion letters of genetic code. And every single human genome that has ever existed and that will ever exist is absolutely unique, and that includes identical twins. So genetics is really complex, but um, politics is way, way harder. <laughs> and and I, I won't do that at all. We will have one more question from the public, so if you could transfer the microphone to someone that really puts the hand on. Okay? Okay, so, okay. Look at the camera. Okay, I'm not very good on these things. <laughs> but anyway, okay. And uh, we have one more question, but I... Oh, I have another... Ah, okay, we need to finish, okay? So, one hand up. And I want to as ask you one thing more, because I think this... So, you say that, uh, you know, our history as human beings has been a history of sex, correct? Yeah. Will we still... And movement, sex well and movement. Okay, yes. <laughs> Probably they are associated, but... <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> so, will continues to be a history of sex, uh, you know, a story of sex, the future of you... That's, that's what genetics is. Genetics is the... Our genomes are a record of every single successful sexual encounter that our ancestors had. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a record of every single reproductive sexual. Mm -hmm. uh, that's different. I, I need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so last question and then we need to finish, okay? Yeah. Good afternoon. Oh, this is on. Uh, so my question for you would be, um, I, I, my field is not biology or genetics, but I, I've recently read and seen a few videos of, uh, about CRISPR and about genetic modification and going forward, if the future of humanity lies on uh, integrating us with uh, artificial made parts, genetic modifying us or making uh, a new species by completely artificial elements. Mm -hmm. So I'd like your thoughts about that. Well, that's chapter seven in the book. Um, <laughs> Uh, but um, it's, a, it's an important question because the new technology, such as CRISPR, um, is enormously powerful and very easy to deploy. Do you use CRISPR? Mm -hmm. Are you? Yes. Mm. In the parasite. Yeah. Um, I mean, and it's changed so radically. 20 years ago when I did a PhD, it took me three years to do one experiment and it didn't work. Um, at the same lab did exactly the same experiment in two weeks using CRISPR. Can we modify humans? Well, yes, we can. There was a very controversial case this time last year when a Chinese researcher announced the birth of two twins who he had attempted to genetically modify to make them um, immune to HIV infection. Uh, he failed at that, and it was the single biggest ethical violation I've ever come across in my career. Um, and if it had one positive effect, it was that it unified 
the biological community against him, including the Chinese, who, are, who can be somewhat secretive about what research is going on. From a technical point of view, it is possible. But if anything, that awful uh, experiment on babies, or embryos that were born, was a demonstration that we are not yet, uh, although it's technically possible, we don't have the knowledge of genetics or of CRISPR or of any gene editing um, techniques to warrant doing this in the slightest. We, as I said a minute ago, we don't actually understand how eye color genetics works. And I wouldn't bet on the co eye color of my own children. And I sort of understand this stuff. So when it comes to modifying humans more generally, we are most definitely in the realms of science fiction, but it is a conversation that we should be having. So we need to finish. OK, thank you very much. And uh, And of course, this is always too short, you know, to go in. But this is really a very important point also that, you know, for any social decision and political decisions that were really approached here, that scientists need to be involved because it's very important that decisions are made in a rational way and not based on something that is completely rational and on a kind of gut decision, basically. Scientists should be involved. Mm -hmm. But scientists shouldn't make the decisions. Yeah, exactly. Should inform. Exactly. Should give the information for the people then to take the decision. So thank you very much. And thank you once again to okay. Fundação Francisco Manuel Santos that give us the opportunity to really receive people like Adam here and to be able to talk uh, about uh, so important subjects. Thank you very much. Thank you.